Well, joining us now is Richard Weiler, and he is the author of Chasing Normality, and he joins us from Lincoln, Nebraska. Mr. Weiler, why did you call your book Chasing Normality? You know, I, I have fought with uh, coming up with a title for a long time, and then one night in, in bed thinking, I thought, well, that's what my life has been, has been a chase for norm normality. I think it's... Uh, Maybe it's fairly common among post-polio people. We, we always try and strive to, to live normal lives. And were you able to do so? Have you done so? Um, uh, it's a process, and I think I've done so to a point. But uh, lately I've had some more physical problems, which have made it uh, impossible to live the life I had lived. Well, Mr. Weiler, tell us about the life you had lived. You went to law school, and after that, what happened? Well, I, I guess I started at the beginning. I got polio at 15, just before the shots became a, available. So I struggled to get uh, through high school, thanks to the uh, superintendent of county schools. I uh, started in college living with my uncle because he said no one would give me a chance unless I could prove that I could do it. And then uh, I spent a year in South Dakota doing that. And then on to Missouri, they had uh, developed a program for handicapped students. And uh, I was accepted there. And uh, law school had always been kind of a dream because uh, the two of the patients at the original uh, rehab hospital were lawyers, and they didn't... Uh, they seemed like they had uh, something going, going for them. They wanted to, to uh, continue their normal lives, and that's what I wanted. So I applied for law school and got accepted. And I don't know how I ever got through. That was a, there was a different era back then. They uh, invited a bunch of people in and then tried to weed you out. So. Uh, what was it like to be in a wheelchair during law school in the 1960s? It was um, it was interesting. Uh, thank goodness the law school at the University of Missouri didn't have that many steps. The only room I uh, couldn't get into was the trial practice room. So, but there were no aides. There were very few elevators. You depended on people, and uh, I didn't have much trouble there. Uh, people were always picking me up and pushing me to the next the next class. Um, my one good thing about being in the wheelchair is I might have been conspicuous, but uh, I think the professors didn't want to call on me. <laughs> but my theory was to, to hang low. And, and what does that mean? That means keep your head down keep writing notes and try not to get called on because the uh, Socratic method was rather brutal in, in the 60s. Well, let's go back just a little bit, Mr. Weiler. What happened at age 15 to you? Uh, I, I woke up one day with a severe headache. It was a classic symptom of polio. I checked into the hospital uh, probably two, day, two days later, and I started losing uh, muscles uh, over the course of a week to the point where I had to be put in an iron lung just to keep breathing. Um, within, a, within a week? Within a week, yeah. It, it, all, it all changed within one week. Now, most polio patients don't live uh, but a few years, is that correct? I don't know. I don't know if there's studies on that or not. Uh, so we seem to have the ability to live fairly uh, normal lifespans. Um, one of my friends died of cancer. One died of a brain hemorrhage. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt died of a brain hemorrhage, hemorrhage. But I think that was a result of overwork and under medication. So overnight, Mr. Weiler, you went from playing baseball and being a part of 4-H and being a farm boy, as you say, to being in a wheelchair. This is true. Uh, within the space of a week, uh, actually, I went from farm boy to, to iron lung, and um, I spent six weeks in that iron lung, and believe it or not, I didn't want to come out of it when the time came. I was scared to death. I was comfortable. 
Super Bowl in that steel cocoon, and I wasn't uh, wasn't ready to come out of it. It's like you're comfortable where you are. So and then when I did get pulled out of it by people who knew better, it uh, expanded my horizons. Now, you've, this book has been endorsed. You've got a couple of blurbs on the back of the book from uh, two well-known folks, uh, former Attorney General John Ashcroft and Missouri Senator John Ashcroft, and also Jack Danforth, former uh, Missouri Senator. Did you work for both of these gentlemen? Yes, I did. I, uh, I got a job with the Attorney General's office out of, uh, out of law school, uh, and uh, three months later, Jack's and was swept into office, and uh, thankfully for my sake, he retained me, and uh, it was a good working relationship. He brought in a lot of new people. It was a, it was a good time. The Attorney General's office uh, overnight became a uh, front runner, uh, uh, sort of a bellwether for the state of Missouri, and uh, same with uh, Mr. Ashcroft. Uh, he and I had moved on to some other agency to try to do some direct work, and uh, when he was elected, he asked me back. So I had a good working relationship with both of them, and they were kind enough to write uh, the little editorials on the back of the book. Well, uh, Richard Weiler, this book came to our attention at Book TV via Justice Clarence Thomas. He told us about it. What is your relationship with him? I've known Clarence since the first day he uh, arrived in the Attorney General's office. Jack Danforth recruited him out of Yale. And so our relationship goes back some 35 years. We uh, actually worked together on a couple of cases, uh, consulted with him. I probably spent every day eating lunch with him discussing the events of the world. So Clarence is a, is a good, good, good friend. And I had a feeling somebody must have Given you a tip on the book because it uh, hasn't had much publicity. I haven't been able to market it. How long did it take you to write it? Um, well, I started writing 10 years ago. Uh, I wrote the first three chapters. Uh, I did it because Clarence and other friends were urging me to put my story down. They said it, uh, I shouldn't pass from the scene without people. Uh, knowing what happened, and then it just stalled. I, I couldn't find a way to, to make it sound realistic or something other than just modeling stuff, and I didn't want to be that way. And then three years ago, uh, Maureen Clark, serendipity, just walked into my life, and she's a freelance writer. She'd never done a project like this, but she said she'd help me with it. So between the two of us, it took about three years. What what do you want people, when they read this book, what do you want them to take away from it? That, that as long as there's life, there's, there's hope. It doesn't matter what you do, uh, just do something. Uh, I, I'm not a, a leader. I'm, I'm not a, I don't see myself as a forerunner or someone to look up to, but I hope the book would give people a chance to say, well, gee, Look what he did. I can do that. Now, given given the fact that you're in a wheelchair and have polio and uh, essentially paralyzed from the neck down, correct? Yes, yes. Um, how did you write this? Was it dictated or? Uh, well, Maureen and I spent time with a dictation unit. Uh, and she would feed me outlines and sample passages, and then I just uh, took those iron bones and, and filled them out with a, with a um, computer and a mouse stick. I typed it one key at a time. Tell us about your parents. Oh. Well, they're the kind of people who don't give up. They're a farm family. My dad had an eighth grade education, but um, and mom, mom's family is a little more educated, but they're... Um, 